would you please stand to your feet and open your Bible to the book of Jeremiah chapter 9 as we begin this weekend. You know, the commodity of kindness is very scarce. You know that. Kindness is escaping from our society. And yet the kindness of God has never eluded us. We are told here in Jeremiah chapter 9, in verse 23. The emphasis you see in verse 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise men glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty men glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you, dear God of loving kindness. Thank you that you're good, you're merciful. Father, personally, I have given you a hundred reasons to fire me. And yet there isn't no reasons in your sight. You're good. Forgive us of our sin, our blemishes, our trespasses. Anything, Father, that's causing corruption in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, in our consciences, in our homes, with our wives, with our girlfriends, with our children. Father, we, we come like Mebibosheth. We're like a, a dog to you. And yet you love us tenderly. Oh, Father, speak to us, each and every one of us, as we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may have a seat. Thank you, Pastor John. Thank you so sweetly. Thank you so kindly. The text that was given to me is, is in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. In this when, when I was told that I had to study, I, I immediately flashed back to my own life. Because in an allegory, you can be David or you can be Mebibosheth. You will see that in a moment. Now, let's be honest. How many have never heard or read about Mebibosheth? You never have. You're, come on. Where cameras are watching you. God's watching you. Okay. How many do you know about Mebibosheth? Raise your hand. Okay. All right. Uh, there's some people, that they're, not, they're not checked in yet. They haven't they raised their hands for anything. So I don't know. At any rate, here in 2 Samuel chapter 9, in 2 Samuel chapter 9, we'll read the following account. This is King David speaking. Now David said, verse 1, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for the sake of Jonathan. And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Seba. Uh, Seba is not a savory character. He's weird. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, are you Seba? He said, I just serve it, sir. Then the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Seba said to the king, there's still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, where is he? And Seba said to the king, indeed, he's in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel in Lobar. Then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amlet from Lodebar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to come to David, he fell on his feet and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, here is your servant. So David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. And I will restore to you all the land of your grandfather Saul. And you shall eat bread at my table continually. Then he bowed himself and said, what is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And the king called to Seba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given of your master's son all that belonged to Saul 
and to all his house. You therefore and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest that your master's sons may have food to eat. But, may Bibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now, Seba had around 15 sons and 20 servants. Now, that story tells us a lot about David's character. Let me take you back. As the staple singers will say, I'll take you there. I'm reminded of 1 Samuel chapter 16. Something happened to King David. You see, that's what we call an alteration experience. An alteration experience is a character modification. How many of you are married? You've been modified. <laughs> How many of you have grandchildren? You've been doubly <laughs> altered. Barring a problem or a crisis or catastrophic situation. For example, the death of a sibling, the death of your parents, the death of someone you love very young, it causes and creates a character change. Barring that, I have character changes, and I usually refer to those character changes because it altered me, it transformed me. You see, I don't mean, I don't mean to kick a dead horse. I always speak about my experience in the military, always, because it changed my life. That was my first modification. My butt belonged to Uncle Sam. Had no idea, but I was modified. I left the United States Marine Corps 50 years ago. But the Marine Corps has never left me. That changed me. It modified me. People who are not Marines don't understand us. It modified me. But then the second modification is in 1975, May 17, when I became a Christian. I surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ like my Bibosheth. I was all crooked. I was an angel dust. You know what angel dust? Don't worry about it. I was a full-time alcoholic. And like my Bibosheth, God rescued me. He took me in. He modified my head. He modified my heart. I was angry at, 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 at a girl named Mildred. You see, she modified my head. She, she got pregnant. I tried to blame the Holy Spirit, but that didn't work. <laughs> so instead of blaming her, I said, I'm take responsibility for this. But the pressures of home, the treasures of Catholicism, the tradition, she went ahead and terminated a child. Now, I, I was goofy, morally speaking. I was nasty. I'm nasty, morally speaking. But at least I had a little bit of moral fiber, just a little bit. As a Catholic, I said, we, we get drunk all the, every weekend. We feel guilty all the time, but we don't do abortions. So she terminated the child. And I told her, as beautiful as she is, I told her, I will never see you again. I don't want to talk to you again. I don't want you in my life. That was it. And around six months, no, three months later, the grapevine. Ooh, Mildred's now name is Millie. And she is a Christian. She's happy, and I'm thinking, happy? How in the hell can she be happy? What do you mean happy? I want her to feel the torture and the sorrow that I felt. And she's happy. And when I came face to face to her, she looked different. She had gone through a modification process. She was raiding. She was sweet. She asked me for my forgiveness. She cried and she begged. She said, I'm sorry what well, we did. I love you. But, you know, I said, so, so what, you want to get back together? I thought, I have her now. And she goes, no, I don't want to get back together. I said, what the heck? <laughs> she said, I want you to have what I had. What do you have? Just, Jesus came into my life. I don't want it. You see, I had a misconception about Christianity. When I go to Israel, I don't ask for a guide. Now, I'm going to tell you how many times I've been to Israel, not to tell you that, that I'm up there. I'm telling you only to back up my story. 
I've been to Israel 25 times. Now, I've learned. I don't ask for a guide. Give me a special guide. Everybody asks for a special guide. We don't. We deliberately say, give me a pagan, heathen, Israeli guy. Why? Because he is going to see what we Christians are made of. He's going to see 55 to 100 people. He's going to see them, and they're going to watch them all. Because we're there almost 10 days on the ground. They get to smell you. They get to see you. They see if you're irritated. So they see you. You see, I, 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 but I tell them, kindness is very powerful. Kindness is very powerful. At the end, some people, some guides come to Jesus, and some people become aware. And the first thing I tell them, listen, I know you're going to talk about history, and I want you to know that, that the Christians then were not involved in the Crusades. We're not part of the Crusaders. Christianity did not came to America. In Latin America, Central America, even North America. When the colonists came, they brought a different brand of Christianity. Anybody ever heard of Chief Hutui? Anybody? Any historians here? Chief Hutui? Chief Hutui was a Taino Indian. That's, that's by the, uh, the Bahamas. Puerto Rico or Cuba, Dominican, Haiti, that is, that's a Taino region. You ever heard of that? It's crazy. So the Spaniards came and they took over Hispaniola, which is now Haiti and Santo Domingo. Those were their headquarters. And then they had uh, uh, the ability to explore, to go to Mexico, go to Central America, South America. They did not bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were only interested in one thing and one thing only. Gold. So their brand of Christianity was wicked and crooked. They were looking for gold. Well, the word got out because Chief Hutui was one of the Taino Indians. And he escaped for 400 men, women, and children and went, and went to what we know now as Cuba. And he told all the rest of the Indians... These people are not people of God. These people kill. These people maim. And let me, let, let me read to you. And the reason I'm telling you this is because the world is watching us right now as a church. They're watching us. They're watching us very close. We're the only institution in the United States that has not been woke up yet. We're the only institution that we have not been woke up. Look around you. Don't, don't look now. But later on, just look. And you go, what the heck? Look at the kind of people around you. You would never hang around people like that if it wasn't for the church. As recorded by the Spanish priest Bartolomé de las Casas, Hatui showed the Cubans a basket full of gold and jewels. And he said to them, here is the God of the Spaniards' worship. For these they fight and they kill. For these they persecute us. And that's why we have to throw them into the sea. They tell us, these tyrants, that they adore a God of peace and equality, and yet they usurp our land and make us their slaves. They speak to us of an immortal soul and of their eternal rewards and punishments, and yet they rob our belongings, seduce our women, violate our daughters, incapable of matching us in valor. These cowards cover themselves with iron that our weapons cannot break. Hatui was, was captured by a traitor, and they burned him at the stake. But right before they lit him up, a priest went up to him and goes, Hatui, would we like for you to consider heaven? And Hatui is tied up, and Hatui said, heaven? Yes, your sins can be forgiven, and you can enter into heaven. And Hatui said, are you going to be in heaven? Are they going to be in heaven? And he says, we're all going to be in heaven. And he says, 
And then I want to go to hell because I don't want to go to heaven with people like you. Oh, what a staff to the heart. What a staff to the heart. I was like Chief Hatui when Mildred said, I'm a Christian now. Get out of here, you and your Bible. I was ignorant. I was ignorant. But as I shared with you, you see, King David, according to 1 Samuel chapter 16, he, he was just minding his business. And the Bible says that Samuel the prophet came looking for a man. And the Bible says that he was looking and finally he couldn't find it. He saw an NFL player, handsome guy. One green eye, one blue eye, handsome. And Samuel said, oh, ooh la la, this is, home. That's, this is him right here. And God said, no, that's not him. For I'm God, I do not look at the outward, outward appearance. I look at what? At the heart. So he passed through all the sons. Do you have anybody else? I have a goofy red hair out there. He comes over here. And the anointing came upon him. He was anointed. He didn't ask for it. He wasn't looking for it. But right there and then, he had a character modification. In the same chapter, we are told that the king of Israel by the name of Saul, he got twisted. He derailed morally. And God took away the crown from him and took away the Holy Spirit from him. And he gave him what kind of spirit? Distressing spirit. And the Bible says that every time he go crazy, he needed some music. So they hire someone that can play the harp to mellow homeboy out. <laughs> and they said this of King David in verse 18 of chapter 16 of 1 Samuel. He's a mighty man of valor. He's a man of war. He is prudent in speech. And he's also handsome. <laughs> the Holy Spirit came upon this man, young man. And then we are told in chapter 17 that a knucklehead of a Philistine by the name of Goliath. You know the story? Young boy gets up and boom. And Saul says, who is that man? That's the guy that plays music for you, fool. And he recognized him. So he invited him into the court. David from Bethlehem gets into the court. In chapter 18 of 1 Samuel verse 1, we are told there, if you read it ethically, hermeneutically, you read it that Jonathan fell in love with David. His soul was knitted together with David, Jonathan. Later on, that friendship became documented through a covenant. Now, in California, around five years ago, this was this sordid, twisted teaching that they had a, a progressive relationship. Twisted, man. Twisted. Again, I go back to my experiences. You, you don't know Sturkel. You don't ever meet Circle. <laughs> Me and Floyd Circle, a white boy from Idaho. We ran together for 13 months. I knew about his mama. I knew about his girlfriend. I knew about his brothers. I knew everything. And we were buddies. We slept together. Nah, don't get twisted. <laughs> I had the top bunk. You had the lower bunk. We slept together geographically. It was a, it was a friendship that, that, was, that, that was solidified when, when you're in battle. It's called baptism by fire. Jonathan, is, he's a warrior himself. He is a man of great valor. So here we got two mighty men, and they make a pact together. Finally, the father gets so twisted, he wants to kill David, but Jonathan favors David. He goes, David, you're the anointed man. My father's crazy. He's a 5150. He's crazy. He says, but I know you're anointed. He says, make a covenant with me there in chapter, in chapter 20, 1 Samuel. He says, make sure that God's kindness comes upon us. Please. 
And David made a promise, a covenant. I will protect your people. Now, why, what does that mean? You see, when in the ancient East, when a king will take over, he would eliminate all the previous royalty members, even babies. That was the way it was. Saul's descendants had to all die. So he made a pact with them. That's the end of that. The end of 1 Samuel ends with Jonathan, Saul, and two brothers getting killed. That's the end of 1 Samuel. In 2 Samuel chapter 1, <laughs> forgive me, it's my wife. She knows, she knows, don't bug me. She goes, no, have you taken your medicine? <laughs> so 2 Samuel starts, and we find in chapter 2 that David finally was coronated as king in Hebron. He's the king of Israel. And then fights go on. The Bible said that the house of David was fighting against the house of Saul, and the house of Saul got weaker, and the house of David got stronger. And so finally, when you get to chapter 9, here's King David, solidified as the king of Israel. Now he wants to know, are there any relatives, any relatives? He knows that all the sons are dead. So he wants to give the contribution or the benefit of the covenant of kindship to who's ever alive, grandma, grandpa, whoever it is. And Ziba comes over here and says, yes, there's one descendant. His name is Mabibosheth. That's chapter 9. But in chapter 4 of 2 Samuel, we know why he's lame. The Bible says that his babysitter was taking care of five-year-old Mabibosheth. He's the prince. He needs to be protected because he's going to get slaughtered. So the babysitter was running away and fleeing from the madness when somehow she dropped him. It must have been a heavy-duty fall because both of his feet were crippled. Years passed by. He knows who he is. He's hiding. He's crippled. He's in obscurity. He's a non-entity. He's a nobody. But God recognizes nobodies. You see, I'm very aware of who I am. I see people in California as well as I see here in South Carolina. They are, we call them invisible people. They're the kinds, they're clean the rooms. They're the kind that pick up your dishes. They're the people that cut your lawn. They're the people that build houses. And then they're on the street. And then they're insignificant. We call them zeros, not entities. But in the eyes of God, they're highly valuable. You see, in Matthew chapter 25, I never, never looked at it this way. In Matthew 25, says there's going to be a judgment, right, of the nations. So the Bible tells us, if I may, this, I mean, when I reread it again with a different, different, different perspective, he said, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all, all his holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Just for instructional purposes, you guys are the sheep right here. These are the goats. Okay. Now, both goats and sheep don't know what's happening. Why are we here? They're about to find out right now. So, the shepherd comes and looks at all these sheep. And the Bible says, and he, sit, and he will sit the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. There's the, that's that sign right there. We're what? 
blessed of the Father. Woohoo! Right, 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 right on. <laughs> Meh. <laughs> Meh. And the ghosts are going, hmm, what's up? Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Uh, then the righteous, that's another word for the sheep, righteous and blessed, two key words. And the righteous will answer saying, Lord, what's up? When did we see you hungry and fed you or thirsty or gave you a drink? Oh, when did we see you a stranger and you took us in or naked and clothed you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, I Surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to the invisible people, to the non-entities, those that society looks at them as outcasts and nobodies, when you do it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Credentials? Where's credentials? Success? What success? Are you going to stand there as a, as a goat later on? You as a goat, you're going to say, but, but, but I build churches. I have a master's. I own a business. What did you do in my name? You know, I'm supposed to speak on the principles of kindness. One principle is this. I'll leave you with this. Someone who is a Christian can lose their kindness. Kindness is the same thing as goodness. It's the metrics of the Holy Spirit. It is the metric of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Kindness and gentleness and goodness and love, self-control, all the other stuff. But kindness is a word that is used even in the old King James is used as charity. Charity. Kindness is when you experience the peace of God, you give it back to reflect to God. There, there are scriptures that tell you how it operates. There are scriptures that God gives it to us. Romans chapter 5, I believe in verse 4, tells us, For the love of God is given to us by the Holy Spirit, and it goes directly to our heart. Therefore, it creates hope, and hope never disappoints, because the love of God is poured by the Holy Spirit into our hearts. It's contamination. You immediately become a new person. Every crisis, every situation that caused you to walk like, like, like Mephibosheth will cause you to embrace the pain and realize that the pain is good for you. But the principle is that people can lose their kindness, reverse the kindness. They become jerks. Have you ever met Christian jerks? Yes or no? That's a weak. Tell me yes or no. Yes. Don't be lying, man. There are people who say they're Christians and they smell like lemons. How can you tell someone if, if they're kind people? What is the first thing you see? What is the first thing you see if they're kind? A what? A smile. When you, how are you going to see my smile? So how else can I show my kindness? Okay, you can't see my smile. What else can you detect if I'm kind or not? What? The eyes. Absolutely, especially the eyebrows. If, they, if they're blurring, like, what the heck? Okay, the eyes. What else? Body language. Tonal, infle in, 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 tonal inflection. I can say, good morning. Or I can say, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Do you understand that? The goats on the left side. The same thing. When did we see you naked? When were you in prison? If you did not do it to the least, you did not do it to me. Enter into perdition. Friends, it's very serious. I believe that kindness has brought more people to Christ than, than people preaching. 
I, I believe that. Kindness. <laughs> Kindness. Kindness is powerful. Kindness is a divine virtue. Kindness is a byproduct of the love of God. Love, agape love, is given by the Holy Spirit from Jesus himself. Romans 5.5. 5. It is the golden rule, Matthew 7, 12. Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. Fifth, kindness is a universal language. The reality, six, the art of kindness is a scarce commodity. Seven, kindness can be cultivated. And lastly, one can lose his or her kindness, revert to being a jerk, intolerant, indifferent, bitter, harsh, hostile, curt, sarcastic. Now, I never read really like I'm reading 1 John. Check this out. Just check this out. John says this, okay? <clears throat> He's the oldest guy to die. He writes in his late 80s. He doesn't say like, hi, how are you? This is John. He gets to the point. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which have seen with our eyes, which you have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of God. The life was manifested, and we have seen and have witnessed and declared to you that eternal life, which was with the Father, was manifested to us. That which we have seen, that which we have heard, we have touched, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Now notice verse 4 of 1 John 1. He says, and I write these things... That your joy may be. Why is he writing that? What is the implication? That there are people who are not being joyful? That's exactly what happens. You see, it happened to one of the churches. He says, you left your first love. And what happens when that love is not in action in you? It's replaced by your nature. Your natural tendencies. You're ugly. You're nasty. We have no, we have no, no, no Holy Spirit uh, filter. We reason to our own logic, who you are, who you think you are, and who they are. We have no such privilege as Christians. We're Mebibosheth. Remember now. Who am I? I'm a dog and you're saving me. He restores everything to you. He gives you back everything that belongs to you. And he says, you're going to have a seat on my table. Oh, my God, why? What have I done? Just as you have received, so give back. Give back. Go get it. Go to others. See, these goats had no idea. The sheep had no idea. They did bullshit. Just like everyone else that has received Jesus Christ, we're never the same. John says, I didn't know this. You see, there was an invasion in the church. It was called Gnosticism. Gnosticism means knowledge. And if I may, and I close with this, I connected the dots, man. I've been a Christian for 46 years. I'm still connecting dots. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you know, listen, listen to what he says. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but if I have no love, I become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have, here we go, check this out. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and I understand all the mysteries and all the knowledge, what mysteries? And knowledge, okay, that's my time. What mysteries and what knowledge? The word for knowledge is nosies. What is Paul speaking about? You see, the invasion came in during John the, the beloved John's age. A new ideology has stepped into the church. That knowledge was greater than faith. And the knowledge came in mysteriously. And you have to be initiated into this knowledge. So how do you get the knowledge? Well, if you don't know, you don't have it. <laughs> so that created superiority. When you have superiority complex, 
You think you're better than others. And you intimidate others by your knowledge. You intimidate others by your tenure, your credentials, who you is, where you're stationed in life. You intimidate others by who you know, what you know, and how long you've been at it. And you know what? You're nothing. Galatians chapter 6 verse 3 says, He who thinks of somebody when in reality he's nothing, he fools himself. I'm just a nobody trying to exalt somebody to tell everybody who Jesus is. The best way to communicate with people is to act kind. What is kind? Acknowledgement. A what up? How you doing? Good morning. How are you? May I please? No, no, you go first. I'll open the door for you. You go ahead. Thank you, sir, for picking up my dishes. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. By the seventh thank you, I got him. By the seventh thank you, I got him. They begin to act human. You're welcome, sir. You're welcome. Kindness is a universal language. It belongs to us, Christians. Amen. Tonight, as we begin tonight, as we begin tonight, be kind. Don't be a jerk. Go meet someone you don't know. Don't hang out with your buddies. The same place. You were last year, the same buddies. Don't do that. Go out and meet others. What's your name? See, I just met some pastors. They all spoke about their private world. Woo! Open up your private world. Open up your private world. Don't try to pretend you're somebody. You just met people shit. You just... <laughs> I know. Me too. Greet one another. Don't, don't be like David. He's, they, they kiss each other. Paul said the same thing. Kiss each other with a holy kiss. Don't, don't, don't get crazy. Don't get twisted. <laughs> Just an elbow shake. That, that's fine. A smile or what up, you know. But don't be a jerk. We can't afford to be jerks. Not with our families. Not with our wives. Not with our children and grandchildren. Don't be a jerk in society. Be a light and salt. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for this morning. <laughs> this morning. Ah! We thank you, Lord, for today, this evening. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for your sweetness. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you, Father, for the transformation. Thank you, Father, for renewing our minds, our heads. Thank you for cleansing us of all sin. Thank you for registering our name in the book of heaven. Thank you, Lord, that in spite of who we are, Father, we walk with the limp, but we will never deny you. Go before each and every one of us. Bless this week. Bless us with your presence that the benefits of this changed life in this weekend, our children and our family and our spouses will benefit from this change. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>